what do you get when you combine cutting edge space optics technology with a price tag big enough to buy a house? The Plane Wave CDK1000. Welcome to Snow King Mountain in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, a playground where billionaires go to ski. And now it's also for those into serious stargazing. Today we're getting hands on with this astronomical beast to uncover what makes it such a star among telescopes. And by the end, we'll give it a desired rating to see if it lives up to the hype or if it's a stellar money pit. This is Desired. The telescope I'm about to see is worth an eye-watering $600,000, which is a pricey entry point for a hobby and significantly more than anything you'll find at your local scope store. However, astonishingly, this piece of kit claims to actually be good value for money, with the company that makes it, PlaneWave, able to deliver in around two months and install in a single day, something never thought possible before. I'm heading up to meet Joe Zeta, director of the Snow King Observatory, to get a look at the cutting edge facility. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I'm going to show you just what goes into making the CDK-1000, back where it's manufactured in Adrian, Michigan. Hello, hey, hey, how are you doing, Rick? Rick? Kevin, hey, nice, nice, nice to meet you. you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. So this is what we've come to see. This is the, the CDK-1000. CDK-1000, yeah. yeah. So this is a one meter telescope. And what that means is the main mirror that gathers all the light is one meter in diameter. So that's the 1,000? That's the 1,000, 1,000 millimeters. Right. The light comes in the front here, hits a main mirror down here, goes up, hits that mirror there called the secondary, comes down here, hits another mirror that's at a diagonal, and sends the light out this port here. You do your mirrors in-house. Could you not get them made elsewhere? We could not get them made elsewhere. We decided we had this design with this lightweight mirror, which means the whole telescope gets to be lighter weight, higher tack, and we get to use all the most modern technology and materials and everything. And we went to companies and they just, they couldn't do it. Okay. They said, well, it's gonna be a bunch of money and it might take a year, two years to make one mirror. So we experimented in-house and Within about six months, we were able to, to make our own mirror. I noticed these USB ports here. Can I charge my iPhone on that? You could. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely. <laughs> what can it do? What, how far can it see? How far something can see is, is always the first question. And we've had one of our customers take a 17-inch telescope, much smaller than this, and try and image a quasar that was 12.9 billion light years away which is almost to the edge of the observable universe. And we jokingly say, how far can you see these telescopes? You say, all the way. For people who don't know this field, how is this different? So when we came into the market, in the one meter market, you know, it could be $2 million, 1.8, sometimes you can get $1.2 million. This telescope weighs 3,500 pounds. They weighed, you know, like 9,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds. You're joking. It would take know. you five years to get one. Yeah. Because really? they're custom made, every single one. And, and how quickly can you build them? Really, we can deliver usually in about two months. We ship them to our customer, we go out and install them, and they're installed in one day. Now, whilst all that sounds very impressive, we're still talking huge amounts of money here. Rick assured me that their new CDK and direct drive technology justifies the cost. CDK stands for corrected Dalkirkum. Dalkirkum is an older design, so we modified that design and added corrector lenses and made a much more high functioning telescope. And since it's easier to make, it's also a lower price. Right, okay. This is a CCD chip. This is 52 millimeters on the diagonal. And you can see the star in the center and a star at the edge are identical. And, that, and there's not many telescopes that can do that. But then the other part of that is the direct drive. This is probably like a bunch of five minute images added together. So you're tracking the sky for five minutes. You're correcting for the fact that Earth is rotating, staying centered on the object, and any deviation will, will make these stars look elongated. So it's one thing to have an optical design that gives you points, but you've got to track well enough. Back at Snow King, Joe took me to the planetarium to see some rendered images from the CDK-1000. Here we have the Orion Nebula, which is Messier Object 42. Wow. 
And that was taken with the, this telescope, the CDK-1000 that you've got on the roof? Correct, yes. And that's one of the things that I think is just so amazing about a telescope like this is it's something that's available that uh, for the people in the general public where you don't have to have, you know, three doctorates to be able to use it. It's allowing us not just to take people's breath away and allow them to see the, uh, the, the beauty that's out there in the cosmos that we want to study, but it also can uh, get those younger generations excited to say, oh, wow, that's beautiful, but really, what is that? What's the physics behind that? What's going on there? And they maybe be interested in studying cosmology, interested in studying astrophysics, and really propel that uh, next generation of humanity forward to you know, bring us out to the stars and learn more about what we can, which also helps learn more about us, who we are. Over at Planewave, Rick was excited to introduce me to Dan Rolker, the co-founder and CEO of RSky a platform that connects multiple telescopes from around the world, providing real-time observational data and analysis of objects and activities in space. Now, they're merging with Planewave to create a new company called Observable Space. This industry has really had a kind of a, a, a gap between the hardware itself and the actual software that, that leverages the hardware and processes the data. So that's kind of where the idea of observable space came from, where combining plane wave and our sky uh, for the software side uh, to build that, you know, product that's really never been built before in this industry. This is live data, is it? Yeah, yeah. Live data, so it's tracking a satellite here. Yeah, th this is just a kind of a, a live view of, of some of the, the telescopes we have around the world that are tracking different satellites. What you're seeing here is all these different streaks in the image are stars, because what's happening is the telescope is tracking a specific object in space. That object is is basically the box right here with yeah. the dot. In, in order to understand where an object is in space when we're tracking it this way, you solve for the midpoint for each of the streaks on those stars. And once you have the midpoint of all of those streaks, you can then compare it against star maps that we have to understand where it's pointing. And then it can basically say, this is at this very kind of nanosecond precision of time, this is where this object was in space. And that is useful information because it's useful information for anyone that needs to um, maneuver, plan maneuvers, or operate any spacecraft that is, that's in orbit. You don't so want to hit anything. You don't want to hit anything, and you also just want to know where things are at. Even though you might have an equation that says, you know, five minutes from now, this object should be here, when there's a lot of uncertainty based in with like solar pressure, atmospheric conditions, things like that, it actually might not be where you thought it should be in five minutes. So you need to be able to track these objects to, to understand where that's at. These telescopes can perform laser communication, can't they? Yeah, so LaserCom is really like the next gen for space communications. It's 10 to 100 times faster than RF frequencies. RF being? Uh, radio, yeah, radio frequencies. It's very low power for spacecraft. And the further away from Earth you get, the more beneficial laser communication becomes. So it's kind of a holy grail, if you will, for kind of building out that next kind of level of communication for the space industry. NASA and JPL recently just did the longest optical link and laser communication with their Psyche spacecraft. What they ended up getting with when they closed that link, I think it was like six point some megabits per second. And it was about maybe 250, five million miles from Earth or something like that. Um, and generally, like when you have spacecraft that far from Earth, you're really looking at like bits per second. Um, so if, with RF, it would be... Yeah, bits to maybe kilobits per second. Kilobits per second. Up to, a, but with laser com, it was around like 6.5 megabits per second. Which is a lot, sometimes it's actually some people's home Wi-Fi. Yeah, totally, it might be a little bit faster. But yeah, yeah, that was like the first test, right? So even like getting even greater speeds is definitely in the cards for the future. So just to be clear then, everything you're talking about, the integration of the software, but also this idea of uh, the laser communication um, and everything else, it's, that's all possible with the CDK-1000, yes? Is that Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely multifunctional. So they're not like just for one specific thing. So like if you wanted to do astrophotography and kind of explore the cosmos for a little bit with, with uh, our flagship, like you can do it. And then the next like, you know, five minutes later, you could be receiving laser communications. From the sounds of it, Rick and Dan are trying to grow not only a better global system for studying space, but also drastically lower the entry point on who can access a cutting edge telescope like the CDK-1000. And I love the idea of democratizing and sharing access to a worldwide network of telescopes like the one at Snow King. It feels like a genuinely positive step in encouraging a new generation of space explorers. As night fell on Snow King Mountain and with clouds ominously rolling in after clear skies all day, my time had finally come to see what all the fuss was about. 
This is Jupiter we're about to look at here. That's correct. And it's moon. You see some of the cloud band patterns and uh, the other bright spots around it are the Galilean moons. That's amazing. We've even seen some of the colors of it too. And some of those clouds are, are different ammonia compounds, different uh, hydrogen compounds. God, it doesn't quite look real. It, like, <laughs> you don't expect to the, see the colors, the, the cloud bands, everything like that. Yeah, that's actually one of the comments we get from a lot of people, in particular with, uh, with Saturn's rings, when they're looking at that, is they think, they think it's just like, how can this be real? You guys are gonna, you gotta have a look at this. Rather, you while you're here, you're pretty. It is exciting. Yeah, I think so too. It's it's amazing. It's and it, you know, in some ways, like you said, it makes you feel small. And the immensity of the cosmos, or even just our solar system, it, to me, a lot of times, it also makes you feel very large and a part of the cosmos because we're looking out at another planet and uh, you know, it, it, you know, that light reflecting off of it from the sun and coming back to your eyeball, and it just kind of makes you you know think about uh, what other things are out there to discover. Imagine having a really nice you know glass of whiskey going out onto your back porch where you've got your own little dome, you know, yes. like that. And one of, and the CDK 1000 stuck out there go, I'm just gonna go out, have a little drink, and I'm gonna look at the planets for a bit. So we've come to the end of our voyage of discovery, really. This CDK 1000 by Plane Wave, I mean, what's impressive about it is that you can put it in your backyard if you've got one big enough, but you can also then contribute to genuine scientific research. And it's also democratizing science in this field. You don't normally get to say that with super expensive kit, but you cannot get away from the fact that what we've discovered with this thing is that this used to cost millions and millions. And through innovation and through trying to use new technologies and new software. They've tried to make something here playing with that anyone can use and it can do things that weren't possible only a few years ago. I love it. This gets a nine out of 10. I wasn't prepared for how exciting it is to see something that's in our own solar system. So it's not really stretching the abilities of this telescope at all. Yet, I'm still looking at something that's half a billion miles away and I've never seen it like that before. With Desired, we've looked at things that are just for you. Super high-end speakers, driving simulators. This isn't that. This is for the greater good. This is for everybody. And that's what really makes it special.